Hi there, and welcome to Best Practices for Machine Learning Product Decisions. My name is Dai Deng, and I work at Google as a UX designer and senior design advocate. Let's dig in. Here's what you can expect from our time together today. First, we're going to be discussing the user impact of technical decisions. In other words, this isn't an AI ML 101. We're not going to be talking about how to clean up your data or you know, different types of neural networks, but we're going to be focused on AI ML product decisions 101. In other words, we're going to be bringing in some bigger picture context around your AI product that will impact it as much, if not more so, than the technical feasibility itself. Second, we're going to be introducing and applying concepts from the People Plus AI Guidebook, which is a resource that you can use to guide your AI product decision making. And as we're doing that, we're going to be learning together by working through a few different key product scenarios of how teams have made their own AI product decisions. So before we dig into what's different or unique about designing AI-driven products, let's first level set on what we mean by AI ML. Um, you'll note that for the purposes of this presentation, uh, of course, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. All ML is AI, but not all AI is ML, right? But due to just how our industry happens to be using use this terminology, um, you'll be hearing me use it interchangeably and synonymously, even though technically I know you know that they're not interchangeable and synonymous. So just getting that out of the way. That aside, you may also see on Twitter or the internet, various blogs, all these different types of terms, ML product decisions, human-centered AI, UX of AI. What do we mean by all this? And why does it actually matter? How does that pertain to you? Well, let's first start with this. So this is an abstract representation of a neural network. And by now, you may have some understanding of how machine learning works, and maybe you even tried your hand at training your own machine learning models like this, right? But what does it mean for you and your team to go from something like this to something that's actually productized? Like this. Say if you were actually developing a mobile app that utilizes, say, an image classifier model to enable users to hold up their phone, scan their environment, and visually search it to indeed detect that this is a cat. And machine learning is used to drive all sorts of different experiences and products in our lives, right? Everything from recommendations like this to really high stakes use cases like autonomous driving. But here's the thing, as more and more experiences are built with AI ML, it's really critical that we as product creators understand the role that we play in making users feel in control of technology and not the other way around. That's just one key aspect of what we mean when we say human-centered AI, especially given that the general public can have a lot of misconceptions around what AI ML even is and what it means for their day-to-day. -day. And here's another layer of human-centered AI that's really significant because we may be product creators, designers, and developers, but we're also humans, we're also people. And we intentionally and unintentionally shape every facet of machine learning. When you take a high-level look at how machine learning works, training data is collected and labeled that we then feed into models that are built, trained, and evaluated, which then in turn generate predictions, outputs, right? But of course, we play a role in all of this. We're the ones who choose the data sources on which our models are trained. We're the ones who determine the reward function or what success looks like for our models. And we're the one also as users, as people, who get affected by the results of our models. And so this is why the People Plus AI Research Team, or PAIR, works to advance the research and design of people-centric AI systems. We're interested in the full spectrum of human interaction with AI, everything from supporting the engineers and teams that build with AI to understanding people's day-to-day -day experiences with AI. Because it's not just about the technology, but about the impact that it has on us as people. And that's why we're here now talking about this. The PAIR team has developed research tools and resources for build building people-first AI products, such as the People Plus AI Guidebook, which we launched at Google I.O. just last May in 2019. The guidebook is a toolkit, a playbook that can help your team make AI product decisions that are human-centered. 
It's no secret that building with AI can be really expensive and really time intensive, right? So the People Plus AI Guidebook can help you ensure that the time and resources you invest in building AI make a really big impact while putting your individual users first the entire time. And the guidebook itself is the result of, um, is the result of over 100 plus contributors from across Google and Alphabet, synthesizing and sharing out everything that we've learned in recent years about designing and building AI products. The guidebook itself has six chapters, which cover everything from how to identify user needs and defining success for your AI product, your AI-based product, to acknowledging that your models will fail, they will output errors. How, so how can you design for failure and provide graceful paths forward for your users in spite of it? But due to the limited time that we have today, we'll be focusing on core concepts and working through some key product scenarios in these three chapters in specific user needs in defining success, mental models, and explainability and trust. So let's start with the first chapter, user needs and defining success. First, how to identify if AI adds unique value to your product, or a common question we often get, should we AI ML this? I'll note here that user needs in defining success is one of the most important chapters because it covers many of the considerations that are integral to the problem framing phase of the product development lifecycle which, as many of us know, is the bedrock for everything that follows. You'll note in my slides that I have some key concepts outlined for each chapter. So heads up, moving forward, you'll see on these key concept slides for each chapter that only certain questions are bolded. That gives you a sense of what we'll focus today in this talk, while also shows you what else you can learn about in the guidebook itself. There also needs to be a metric that AI could optimize for in meeting the user's need. And we need to ensure we're defining that metric in a people-centered way that's mindful of secondary effects or unintended consequences. And for the purposes of our talk today, we're going to be focused on this last key concept. How can we ensure that your reward function optimizes AI for the right thing? So any ML model you incorporate into your product is guided by a reward function, which determines the action or behavior your system will try to optimize for. This is a mathematical formula that the ML model uses to determine right versus wrong predictions. So let's talk about what we mean exactly by right versus wrong predictions, which is visualized by the confusion matrix. This is a table layout that's used to evaluate these types of model predictions, which are called true positives, true negatives, false negatives, and false positives. And you have a key role in understanding how these impact your user. I know this still seems rather abstract, so we're gonna unpack this using our first key product case study, Google Flights. Thinking back to the last time you took a flight or booked a flight, did you do research to get a good deal? And did any of you use Google Flights as part of your research? Hopefully maybe a few of you at least out there watching this. Well, you may have seen that Google Flights has a feature called Flights Insights that helps you figure out the best time to purchase your airfare. And the Google Flights team used the People Plus AI guidebook over the last year plus to make their AI experience human-centered. So we're gonna use this as an example to help ground out some of these more abstract concepts that we're introducing today. So on the left side, on the left axis of the confusion matrix, we have ground truth, or what happens in reality. In other words, the price of the flight actually went up, it actually increased, or it did not. And then on the top axis here in yellow, we have the AI prediction. In other words, did the Google Flights Insight model predict a price increase or did it predict no in price increase? Let's start by talking about a mo the model prediction that's a true positive. In this case, Google Flights predicts a price increase for a flight that you're considering, say you're thinking of purchasing a flight from Seattle to San Francisco a week from now. And within the next week, the airfare did in fact increase. So everything's working according to plan, a true positive. And the user impact of this true positive is that the user or you are able to make a better informed decision because the AI correctly flags that there would be in fact a price increase. Let's talk about a true negative. This is when the AI model predicted no price increase. And as it turns out, there was no price increase again, Everything's working according to plan. 
So what's the user impact of this true negative, right? Well, you know, so you bought, uh, there's no buyer's remorse and you confidently bought the ticket. But of course, it's not always that easy. So we're gonna take a look at an example of a wrong AI prediction. We'll start with a false positive. Say the AI model predicts a price increase for that flight that's a week today from San Francisco to Seattle, but in reality, there is no price increase. Well, that's a problem. There's a disconnect, right? So what's the user impact of this false positive? Imagine that you saw the price increase prediction on Google Flights, decided to buy the ticket today before the price goes up, but then you check in not long before you have to actually take your flight and the price is still the same, it hasn't increased. So for you as a user, you're not financially impacted by this wrong AI prediction, by this false positive, but you can imagine that your trust in Google Flights may now be somewhat eroded. Let's talk about the other type of a wrong AI prediction, a false negative. So say the AI model predicts no price increase, but ooh, what do you know? The price actually does go up. So what's the user impact of this false negative, right? Well, imagine the user saw the no price increase prediction. You put off buying your ticket for at least a week or so, and then the prices actually go up on you. Now for you, as you're considering that flight from San Francisco to Seattle, you've missed out on a cheaper price because of this false negative, because of this wrong AI prediction. So let's take a step back and think about this. Between false positives and false negatives, which is a worse experience for your users? After extensive user research and discussion amongst the team, the Google Flights team found that users are more likely to experience false negatives as a much worse experience than a false positive. Because not only did they lose trust in Google Flights, but they had to pay a literal financial cost for this wrong prediction. So as you can see, we have to consider the effects of the AI model getting a prediction wrong in different ways. Because depending on your product, your user, your use case, people are going to experience false positives and false negatives differently. So let's talk about the role that you play in all this. When it comes to machine learning, there will always be trade-offs in what the model optimizes for. And so your role is in designing for these trade-offs, like the Google Flights team did. Help your team make a product decision around which is the better UX, which impacts the user less negatively, false positives or false negatives. In other words, you'll need to make conscious trade-offs between the precision and recall of the system. That is, you need to decide if it's more important to include all of the right answers, even if it means letting in more wrong predictions, optimizing for recall, or minimizing the number of wrong answers at the cost of leaving out some of the right ones, optimizing for precision. So that's our first chapter. Actionable pointers from user needs and defining success. It's really important that we conduct a user research and sit down together as a team to consider the cost of false positives and negatives on our users and work together to define and design the reward function. Moving on to our next chapter, mental models. So in mental models, it's really important that we understand our users' point of view as they're continuing to use our ML-based products over time. So we're going to cover two key concepts that get at the heart of uncovering and managing user expectations for your AI feature. Which aspects of AI should we actually explain to our users? So you may have experienced this when it comes to purchasing food, removing from the packaging and actually getting to enjoy it and taking it out, right? And this is even more true when it comes to AI and features that are often labeled intelligent or smart that there can be significant challenges in managing expectations for your product. A mental model is a person's understanding of how something works and how their actions affect it. And people will form mental models for everything they interact with, from including people, places, and products. And this is why it's really important that we understand our user's mental model. We have to keep in mind that when it comes to ML-based products, it's an adaptive, not a static system, right? And since it won't have the same output every time, we need to help our users expect what's going to happen. After all, mental models help set expectations for what a product can and can't do and what kind of value people can get from it. So thinking back again to our flights examples, 
What are some mental models that you think users or travelers may have when it comes to buying tickets? Take a moment or so to think about this. I can tell you from in the past that as I've talked to travelers, to fellow Google Flights users, they've cited everything from, oh, you should buy tickets, you know, really late at night on a Wednesday, or, you know, the best prices come when you buy it uh, no sooner than like two weeks in advance or so, uh, so on and so forth. There's lots of different folk mental models that exist out there that affect people's conceptions of when the right time to buy is. And so knowing that travelers bring all sorts of mental models to the table when it comes to buying flights, the Google Flights team helps manage expectations with an explanation available when you click on the Insights tool. When you hover over the tooltip, you can see this message. All insights based on fares observed in the last 12 months for trips in the same season or similar length with the same origin and destination, number of stops, class, and airline. So you can note from this that the Google Flights team is really spelling out what you can and should not expect in terms of how Google Flights provides this insight. And here's another thing that you may have noticed, that the Google Flights team doesn't throw around any mention of artificial intelligence or machine learning or even data in this explanation. Instead, it's choosing to explain how this feature works to the user in terms that are relevant and clear to them. So now you may be wondering, this is, this is interesting, but what can you do to uncover user mental models of your ML-based feature in order to determine what aspects of the AI itself need to be explained, right? So this brings us to the TripTech method which is a mixed methods user research approach that we use at Google for uncovering those user needs and mental models early and often in the product or even the pre-product development lifecycle. So determine, to understand how you can apply TripTech, we have another example of an AI feature that was developed at Google using this method. On the Pixel 2, we shipped a feature that would identify any song that was playing in the environment. The user doesn't need to press any buttons. The phone just IDs the music that's playing and surfaces it on the lock screen of the Pixel. And do note that all of this is done on device. In other words, nothing gets sent to the cloud. So you may be wondering, how does this actually work in reality? Well, it's really cool because this feature uses a couple of different machine learning models. The first model detects whether there's any audio in the environment. And then subsequent models determine whether that audio is a song and it matches it to an audio fingerprint against a database with thousands of songs. So working backwards from this, thinking back to, you know, I know that that's the launched feature, right? But how did the team even arrive at this? Well, as the Pixel 2 team was ideating on upcoming features for their roadmap, they started with problem statements. In other words, challenges that they think users may have that AI could be a good fit for. And so they started with a design process that generates new feature proposals. And in this case, it's a brainstorm, or it could even be a list of some ideas that the design team has, and you note the problem that's being solved. So working backwards again, in the case of the now playing feature on the Pixel 2, the problem statement the team had first written up was, when I hear music I like, I want to know the artist and the title. And this is the exercise that you can do and that the team also walked through. You can gather your cross-functional team together across UX, product management, and Eng, and plot all these problem statements, all these different ideas onto this two by two. And an exercise like this allows us to separate impactful ideas from less impactful ones, as well as to understand which ideas depend on machine learning versus those that don't or might only benefit slightly from it. And of course, whichever ideas or proposals fall in the upper right-hand quadrant here, the ones that have the greatest user impact and are also uniquely enabled by ML, those are the ones that your team will want to focus on first. So coming back to this example, the now playing feature. Within the TripTech method, the team took the problem statement and then ran a survey to validate the frequency and importance of this problem with their target users, with their target population. And then in parallel to the survey, they created a storyboard and conducted focus groups to get the qualitative data to supplement that quantitative data to uncover user mental models about this proposed feature. So in the storyboard, there's three panels. The first panel illustrates the, the problem. 
the problem statement that we saw in the very beginning, right? And within the focus group itself, you can start by showing the participant this panel. When I hear music I like, I want to know the artist and title, for example, a song that's playing at a coffee shop. And then the participants captured their thoughts about the frequency and importance of the problem, like we just saw in that survey. And then you show the group the proposed solution as well as the impact in the next panel of that solution. So we're here we see an illustration of the phone screen. My new phone can listen and display the artisan song title on my lock screen, followed by the last panel in which it illustrates how that feature may meet the, may meet the user need. I'm able to get the info I need without unlocking my phone. And once you've shown these three panels, you can have the group engage in a conversation about this problem and the proposed feature. And we can often get a lot of insight by just showing potential users these simple sketches, these simple storyboards, and nothing more. Because users can really imagine how it fit into their lives and how they might find it useful. So in the case of the now playing feature, what are the things that you imagine concerns or questions that users may have had around how this feature works? Give you a moment to think about that. So you probably won't be surprised that some users asked, how does this impact my battery life? Or does this mean that Google's always listening? And those were key concerns uncovered during this early trip tech process that the team then used to inform the design and development of the product. And so within the settings for now playing, it's very, very explicit um, how this feature works so that, so that in order to preempt and mitigate those user concerns. So as you can see here, now playing runs entirely offline. Again, nothing is sent to the server unless the user takes action on the song. And so the team dealt with it through surfacing this information, this explanation in the UX UI, as well as carefully wording the settings themselves. So to recap, TripTech is a method that you can use to validate user needs and uncover mental models about your feature early on in the product development life cycle. And before you ever even start looking into training data or building out a model, this is a great way to help you get your insights into your user's mental model about how they affect, expect the feature to work, which is critical for influencing your product decisions. So to recap, actionable pointers around mental models. It's really important that you conduct user research to get insights into how users expect the AI system to work through methods like TripTech so that you can address those concerns or support and evolve that mental model within the design of your product itself. That concludes our key insight, our key concept for mental models. And now we're gonna move on to explainability and trust. This follows really nicely on the heels of mental models because in that prior chapter, we discussed strategies for learning what your users think about your feature. But in explainability and trust, that's when the rubber really starts to meet the road because now your users need to make decisions based on the predictions of your model. Which really boils down to these key questions. How much should your user trust the AI system? And what are ways to show the user the confidence interval associated with an AI prediction? Because AI products are based on statistics and probability, the user actually shouldn't trust the system completely, but rather based on system explanations that you design, the user should clearly know when to trust the system's predictions and when to apply their own judgment. So let's talk about this through the trust spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, if your user has no idea where this prediction or recommendation is coming from, they may just ignore it. And on the other end of the spectrum, if they're sure that the system always knows best, they may not question it. They may have too much trust in your product or in the AI system. And so you need to work together with your team to brainstorm what kinds of interactions, results, and corresponding explanations would decrease, maintain, or inflate trust in your product. Because the happy medium that we want to strive for is calibrated trust. Again, that users know when to trust the system's predictions and when they need to use their own intelligence to correct the AI. And within the guidebook, we have this worksheet that provides a two by two that can help you consider all these key components to decide the right level explanation for your feature. So what are ways you can help your users calibrate trust without overwhelming them with text? This brings us to confidence level or model confidence, which is, a, which is a statistical measure of how certain a prediction or outcome is. 
And we need to make sure that we set aside lots of time to test if showing mo model confidence is beneficial for our users and your product or feature. Because you actually may choose not to indicate model confidence if the confidence level itself isn't impactful. If it doesn't make an impact on user decision making, then you may not want to show it. So now let's take a look at the various ways that you can display confidence. Here are some key design patterns that you can, you can use standalone or as a hybrid of sorts. Again, it all depends on your user needs and the use case. So we'll talk through categorical and best numeric and data-viz confidence displays. The first is categorical. So categorical displays categorize confidence values into buckets such as high, medium, and low, and they show the category rather than the numerical value. And this example on the right-hand side here is from Gboard, which offers swipe, text, swipe typing in predictive text. It's a slightly modified version of categorical because here you have the best match featured in the center and good matches on either side. Here's some considerations to think through if your team is considering categorical display. First off, you'll need to talk about how you determine cutoff points for best good low match categories. And it's really important to think carefully about the meaning and how many categories there should be. Another option for confidence display is n best, n here representing a certain number of variable like the top one or five matches. For example, Google Lens utilizes nBest. When a user pans their phone's camera over across something, like say a dog, Google Lens will show the top match, like a Labradoodle. And if the user was swipe up, um, they would see lower confidence matches, like say a Golden Doodle or a Poodle. And this approach can be especially useful in low confidence situations, because showing multiple options prompts the user to rely on their own judgment it also helps people build a mental model of how the system relates different options. Another example of mBest, here as we see it in Google Translate, where it suggests the most confident translation of the word cool from English to Russian, followed by other good matches in the alternate translations card below. Another common form of confidence display that you're probably really accustomed to is percentage. But the thing to keep in mind here is that numeric confidence indicators are risky because they presume your users have a good baseline understanding of probability. So some additional considerations. We need to make sure that we give enough context for users to understand what the percentage means. Because new users may not know whether a value like 80% is low or high for a certain context, as well as, it, as well as what that actually means for them in terms of the next step to take. So imagine here in this example of Google Maps, if you as a user saw 80% match for this restaurant, the grill, would that mean that you should go or that you shouldn't go to this restaurant? And last but not least, we have data viz. These are graphic-based indications of certainty. This is an example from Google Brain. And here we have a visualization for predictions of whether or not a kind of diabetic retinopathy is present in the image above. Keep in mind, however, that some common data visualizations are best understood by expert users in specific domains. For instance, for the physicians who are using this particular uh, feature, it may be really important for them to get as much granular data as possible to understand how this prediction was arrived at by the machine learning models. So let's bring this all back to our case study, Google Flights. So take a couple moments here and imagine that you are on the Google Flights product team, right? When it comes to just choosing airfare, if, when, and how do you think it makes sense to display confidence to your users? Give you a few seconds to think through it. Well, ultimately, after extensive user research and iteration, the Google Flights team actually decided not to display confidence, but rather display only high confidence insights simply. So you know how flight prices are unpredictable. The Google Flights team is trying to fix that by giving users a better understanding of what happened to these prices in the past. And to make sure that their price insights are communicating the right message, the team decided to complement each price insight with an additional price history data visualization. On top of this, the Google Flights team wanted to signal to users that based on their AI predictions, that the user can be confident they're booking at the lowest possible price. The next step for the flights team was introducing the price guarantee program to bolster trust. 
Basically, if their models were confident enough that a user was booking the lowest possible price, we're ready to put our money where our mouth is and refund users the difference if we're wrong. Actionable pointers from this chapter. So hopefully now you, you have a better understanding of how you can consider the stakes, system data, and user knowledge impact calibrated trust in the AI system, as well as a number of different patterns for confidence display to help your users understand the output that they're seeing and how they can act on it accordingly. So we've just wrapped up a couple of key insights and scenarios from Explainability and Trust. So let's wrap all this up and talk about where you go from here. So as you can see, as a product creator, you have a key role in making product decisions to help you just calibrate trust in the AI system, designing and defining the reward function with your fellow team members, as well as creating users' mental models so that it evolves in conjunction with your ML-based product. There's lots more to check out in the People Plus AI Guidebook, which you can find here at pair.withgoogle.com slash guidebook. It's gonna take all of us to advance this field of human-centered AI together. Thank you.